past summer, I was actually in Clover, South Carolina, speaking at a school district and was asked to speak there by today's guest, Millicent Dickey. And uh, her and I had connected over uh, the summer prior to it, talking about being there, what it would look like. And really, she just kind of, you know, said, hey, come here. Here's when you're speaking. And uh, really didn't just let me do what I do, which I really appreciated. And her and I talked before, and one of the things I really appreciated is that she didn't just give me an introduction, but she she did a really heartfelt message to her staff. And over the past couple of years, obviously, education has been um, terribly tough, right? And it's always been tough, right? But especially over the last couple of years, it's been extremely hard. And one of the reasons that I wanted Millicent to be on the podcast was because of the talk she gave to her staff. She's chief academic officer. And even though she works in central office, the pride she felt in her staff and how it was received, because I knew her staff knew how much she cared about them. She had grown up in the community and you could feel this real family uh, feeling of the community and how much she appreciated her staff. It really resonated with me. And I remember actually taking my phone and writing, ask Millicent to be on my podcast because I was so overwhelmed with emotion and pride even though this was not a place that my kids were going that I ever taught, I actually even knew about before I was there that day. And it really brought this sense of community and how important that is in education. And Millicent um, grew up in Clover, South Carolina. Uh, she's been there pretty much her entire life, uh, not only as a teacher, uh, chief academic officer and other roles, but also as a student. And you could feel that sense of community that comes out and how important that is. And that's one of the topics we talked about um, a lot uh, with a lot of other things. And so I really love this podcast. Such a great energy from Millicent. Um, big shout out to Clover, South Carolina. Give you one of those. So um, thank you so much for being here for another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, it's George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm so very blessed. I just had a great podcast with Millicent Dickey and uh, it's so great to continue on this conversation as people don't know this necessarily, but I actually record two podcasts at the same time and I just so it, was, it just went so well. I'm so excited to continue on the conversation. Was awesome. Awesome. Now, awesome. Mill Millicent is actually from Clover, South Carolina. She's the Chief Academic Officer um, for Clo Clover School District, which is yeah. right outside um, right outside Charlotte, actually, yes. which kind of messed me up because I was like, why am I flying to North Carolina to go to South Carolina? And so I had the privilege to be in there in the middle of July. Uh, and your staff was wonderful. They were absolutely Thank just you. amazing. They were so welcoming and warm to me. It's actually something I very distinctly re I remember actually being in that auditorium and feeling like, wow, this is like a real, it's really great to see because, you know, a lot of people were <laughs> making some life choices this summer about teaching, right? Yes, they right. were. So like, and then, you know, people are coming back and they're like, on that first day, they're like, did I make the right choice? And you're like trying to make them feel that. But it, it, uh, one of the things I absolutely, you know, can't wait to talk about is Millie, Millicent has actually um, been in Clover her entire life. So she was there as a student and now been there, you know, as an educator for almost her entire career so, minus one year right yes yes so, minus one year maybe we should hear about the one year like what happened that one year <laughs> right so what uh, happened <laughs> but, uh, that well, one year was not bad it was yeah, good I know, I know i know just <laughs> so millison if you could just tell a little, people a little bit about who you are what you do today and how you got to that point that's a great okay. place to start it's a great place to start okay so my name is millison dickey i uh grew up in clover uh, born and raised went through uh schools here in clover went to kynard elementary school and uh graduated from clover high school and so um I've been around basically South Carolina my entire life. Uh, I left Clover as a college freshman. I went to Clemson University, go Tigers. And yeah, uh, I got to give, the, I give <laughs> Clemson that air horn. Right? Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, and then after that, I came back to uh, Clover. I was a young adult working, uh, got married, uh, was married to a spouse who felt like we're going to live in Charlotte. That's the greatest place in the world to live. And, and no doubt Charlotte is a wonderful place to live. And so I went to work in North Carolina one year because I thought I needed to be close to where my house was, not necessarily so, because uh, I did love Clover and, and I came back. Um, 
my path into, into education is actually kind of interesting because I'm the product of two educators and I went to Clemson bound and determined that I was not going to be a teacher mm -hmm. and I was going to be in the world of business and I was going to make tons of money right. and just not be a teacher. And so I had a little bit of a, um, a bump in the road, I don't necessarily say, but I think I figured out my real calling uh, because I was a business major at Clemson for about three years, um, just spending my parents' <laughs> money on college tuition and having a great time, uh, but had an experience where I had to interview someone who had my major in college and what were they doing now? And so I'm not going to get into the what they were doing now, but I figured out that that was not what I wanted to right. do very quickly. And so um, I had to call my mom and dad and tell them that I'm sorry, but I've now decided I'm going to be an education major and it's going to take me a little bit longer to finish college. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> were they excited? Were they excited about that? Uh, I, I, they are. um my parents are they're they're very much so by the book and want you to do things in order um but they uh are very supportive they i say are my dad is no longer with us so um supportive of what i wanted to do in life and, and where i wanted to be the things i wanted to achieve so i have to give them a shout out for that yeah that that's and it like when you actually, so can, can I ask you, so you yes. did several years of business. Do you see As any, yeah, did yes. you, see, did you see any, um, like, is there any overlap? Are there things that you actually learn from that process that help you maybe, maybe help you as a teacher, maybe in your role as a chief academic officer? Like, is there things that you learned through that, that process? That I learned in that process? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, probably, probably about just, um, I think, probably more than anything, just, just about decision making and about, you know, being very slow and methodical about decision making. And uh, because, um, and I, I kind of try to use it from the thing of like, um, measure twice and cut once that, you know, there's no, there's no harm most times in taking a little bit longer to weigh out a decision. Uh, but there is harm once you, that you've you know, cut and made the decision that sometimes you can't really walk that back. So that would be probably the one thing I yeah. would definitely say. So there's actually, uh, so this is not a saying, but I think sometimes in education, it's measure 34 times and never cut. <laughs> Because we yes, like our, we, we do like our meetings. Like, we do we, we do like our meetings. Right. Yes, so that's that's a that's a George original. So if anyone <laughs> that, that measures thirty four times, never I, cut. That's never a, cut. Right. Um, yeah. I love that. That that actually is something that um, is is can be frustrating too. On the other side of it too is that I, I swear, and this has happened that we've I've been in meetings where we've talked about the meetings that we're going to have, and yes. it's like. <laughs> so the meeting is about the meeting. That's what we're meeting about. That's what we're, we're meeting about. Yes. Right. So like that for me was okay. Like we, we got to, sometimes, you know, we got to, it's great that we're being thoughtful, but we also got to move ahead. Like we got to figure out a way forward too. Right. Because indeed. Right. So, so when you talk about like uh chief academic officer, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's it. Not every, I don't even know if every district has that role. Is that like, is that a unique, like, and like, they probably have maybe someone who does some of the things that you do, I'm assuming. Right. Yes. What, like, what's, what is a, what is the role, what is a chief academic officer in a K-12 district do specifically? So in many districts, uh, they may call it an assistant superintendent for academics or that sort of thing, or a deputy superintendent. Some right. people are, uh, we don't have any assistant soups. We only have chiefs. So in our district, we have four chiefs of different um of different areas and so mine is a lot so in terms of i am um i work with people in terms of our k to 12 assessment or really pre-k because we have four-year-olds right. we have a four-year-old program in terms of pre-k to 12th grade um curriculum instruction assessment so though that's all on my Hall of the World. Uh, we also do our federal programs that relate to instruction live um, with this area with me. Um, and also in terms of like
like uh, instructional technology. We are a one-to-one -one technology district, and we've been that way now, I think, about eight years. And so instructional technology and using um, devices for instruction is also under my wheelhouse. So trying to make all of those balls and, and plates uh, spin and make sure that we do what's best for children so they have the best outcomes. Well, okay, so that actually is really interesting to me because a lot of times there's, so let's say in your district, there's a chief innovation officer or a chief sure. technology director, and maybe there is someone like that. And then there's a chief academic officer or like the, mm -hmm. the deputy, you know, the lead in curriculum. And they're right. actually like different roles. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's some, some of this going on <laughs> okay. where it's like, hey, it's like, but you actually combining the two, I find is really fascinating. Right? Well, so I have an innovation person. So in my, in my org chart, I have someone who is the innovation and instructional technology there. They are one of my direct reports. So right. within that, so, so we work to, to think that um, technology is a tool that's used to enhance the instruction. It's never going to replace a great teacher. Um, and it's a tool that we use to enhance that instruction. Yeah. And that, that to me, like sometimes like what I've seen some of the conflict is that mm -hmm. people like, will lo you learn new apps, new technologies, and then they'll, you know, kind of do that outside of the curriculum. And people are like, well, we still got to teach the curriculum as opposed yes. to like, see how do the two mesh? Like how mesh. do the two actually like accelerate? And like one of the conversations, you know, a lot of times we're talking about like devices in the classroom, things like this. I'm like, look, you're, if you, one of the questions I had, well, how does this actually improve learning? I said, if you actually take this technology and you have students to like create something with their knowledge, right? You're, you're not necessarily just getting them to regurgitate something with pen and paper, but maybe actually really create something, build their own connections. They might make a video. You're opening some different avenues to do right. this. So I'm like, I'm like, a I didn't know that about your position. I'm a big fan of that. I love that. Yes. So that makes, and that actually kind of brings me to um, the next part. You actually, we talked a little bit about this and now it's kind of making sense to me. You actually c connected with me to come into your school district. Um, yes. And I do kind of combine the two things. Like those things are really important to me. It's, and a lot of times because, <laughs> because I'm comfortable with technology, I get really frustrated because people think I'm a tech person. I'm like, no, 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 I'm just comfortable with it. But really it's not right. like, if you can't tweet, we got issues, right? Like you just basically write in the, <laughs> the square. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, yeah, you just right. blank space, fill it in. Like <laughs> it's not really that, but it's like, my focus is on really, how do we focus on deep learning and technology can, you know, enhance that in many ways, or and sometimes it doesn't, it just kind of matters yeah. in the situation. So when you're actually thinking about when you brought me in, like what was some of the thinking behind that to like why like why at the time in Clover, we were talking about this, a lot of people, I talk a lot about change. A lot of your staff actually um, grew up there, went away for a couple of years and taught there. So, you know, maybe change is not their thing in some ways. <laughs> So what was some of the thinking behind bringing me in to, to talk to your staff in the to, first place? Today, so our thinking for bringing you in, to, and just to give it a little bit of context, uh, before the pandemic hit, our district, we were trying to dip our toes into personalized learning. And so we had a, a mini conference. Uh, it wasn't anything quite like the scale of what we did this summer. Right. Uh, but we had one because we were trying to dip our toes into it. And I will say, if I think back to those times before the that, we were really thinking about the what of personalized learning, like the flexible seating and that sort of thing, rather than the who of personalized learning. And so the who of personalized learning is, is the kids and then, of course, their teachers. And so um, one of the things I think, George, that resonates in all your books is, is that that whole heart piece and the building, the connections is what resonates there. And so we we wanted to give teachers the permission to understand, yes, we're, we're focused on academics and we're focused on high standards and, and we're not ever saying that we're not. But before you can get to those pieces, you really have to connect with the kids and get at their heart. And so one of the things that I think everyone sees coming out of the pandemic is um, 
it, you've really got to work a little bit harder in building those relationships with students and making that connection with them. And so we felt like we needed to give our teachers some permissions to think about building connection and make building heart um, with your students and, and just and loving loving your students. And that's why we really thought about that. So today, this summer, the thought was focus on the kids and and the whole ownership and agency with the around the kids. And that was the thinking for this summer. Now, we're going to move on and, and we're going to do uh, some more connections because we already have a, a date on the calendar for uh, the 2023 mini conference. Mm -hmm. But in bringing you in, we were really trying to connect with our teachers' hearts to mm -hmm. show them we appreciate you. We love you. We thank you for what you're doing to support children. And we're going to work on how do we build those connections with kids. And, and what, I, like, what I love about that is the idea is it, it's not stops at relationships. Because I think a lot of people get kind of, you know, when we talk about that, it kind of starts with that. Some people get a kind of like a fluffy feeling, right? Like it's just yes. like, oh, we love the kids. And I'm, yeah, of course we love the kids, right? right. It's actually, it is actually to build that relationship. It is way easier to challenge kids, to push them, to get them to right. live right when when they yes. when when you're pushing them and you know they they they're not as nervous to fall because they know someone has their back back and that's, that's part exactly of it too. Right. like i'm actually i think years ago i wrote a blog post like saying like relationships are important but they're also not enough right it's it's exactly. the beginning of that um, and then kind of moving forward and so one of the things i noticed about you know you it was kind of interesting i remember this very specifically when i came to clover Mm -hmm. It is the weirdest drive to get to for and maybe it was just Google Maps to get to to get to the airport. It was yeah. like I'm like, what? It's just back roads. Like I don't even yes, know. Yes, it like, is. Okay, it so is. that wasn't just it wasn't a Google day, right? That like wasn't it, a Google day. That that is it. Yeah, because it was like okay, so like I'm like just winding, you know. So it's like this. this there is no interstate or thoroughfare to get. To to the okay, airport. Really. Okay. I was, yeah, I was like, this is a little bit weird, right? So yes. one of the things that, you know, I guess maybe my own maybe misconception sometimes is some of these smaller communities that are, and I wouldn't say it's like, it's so close to Charlotte, like it's, but it's like, yes. it's like hidden. It's like a weird close to Charlotte, right? Like, yes, you wouldn't yes. just drive by by accident. You have to go, oh, no. by your way, right? <laughs> yes, you have to, you have to intend to get here. Right. And so what I love, what I really resonate with me with, with connecting with you is you grew up there. You mm -hmm. have no, been in this community your entire life, but you are very forward thinking. And and really, so like, what are some of the, I don't know, maybe some of the challenges, some of the opportunities um, that you've seen kind of like pushing this community forward, um, thinking about some of the things that you're doing, even like, because because it could be, it could have been really easy just to say like, hey, let's just keep over the way it was when I went to school, but you're not doing that. But I'm sure there's some things that you hold on to that are really important for the Clover community. But like, what are some of the things that you're like, maybe some of the challenges that you've had, you know, as the community kind of grows, kind like of you, grows. Told me, you told me like your graduating class was about a quarter of the size of your current graduating class when you went to school. Yes, it, it, it is. And so what I'll say is, is that um, we are a small town, but we're a bedroom community to Charlotte. And so there are lots of things where uh, we can push on and give students opportunities to have experiences in the local community. I mean, we're in South Carolina, but we're really, you know, we're a stone's throw across the North Carolina line. And so um, we're fortunate that there are some businesses uh, that are willing to partner with us and give students some opportunities uh, for some work-based learning um, chances that they get to experience and see, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if children are really into arts, they can take advantage of the arts community that is nearby. And um, it's easy to have artists and residents and that sort of thing who come uh, and, and, provide opportunities for children uh, so that they can get their creative genius and, and experience that and, and live into that. Um, so it, it's, uh, there are, you know, it would be very, very easy to kind of just fall to the background and, and not focus on what's out there, but that would be ignoring the kids that are growing up here because they've, 
they've changed it just because they live in a, a small town doesn't mean that they are exactly like they were 30 years ago. There are, there are differences indeed in students. And so we have to recognize those differences and help our students play on those strengths because it doesn't mean that they're not going to have to, and I hate to use the word compete, mm -hmm. but they're going to be expected to know and do the same things that their counterparts in a job that went to a large high school in a larger city, they're going to expect, be expected to be able to do the same thing. So we can't be comfortable and not allow them to have those opportunities. Yeah. And we were talking about this before the podcast. When I was a kid growing up, uh, my parents both immigrants to Canada, um, very limited education. And it was like a non-negotiable that mm -hmm. myself and my siblings are going to college. Mm -hmm. And I think between us, we have, I think, you know, probably 10 plus degrees. Um, and the way the, the, the thinking at the time, and I, it was like somewhat accurate was that, you know, college was like a guarantee to like a right. better life. And now I don't see it the same way. So I'm not, I'm not adamant. My kids go to college. I'm not. And, um, that, that's something, you know, now if that, if they're, whatever their path is, they, they'll need college for it if they need that. But just to go to college for the sake of going to college is not necessarily it's something not necessarily. You know, like we were talking before it is the only guarantee right now is debt it's not yeah. necessarily um you know uh, a, a a career or something that you love and um i think that that to me is something that's really um we have to kind of think about that because i think we can easily fall into a default like just do what we, our parents just want to do the thing right? right so can i i gotta ask you this what is okay. something in clover that you would say was similar as a kid, when you were growing up, I'm kind of putting you on the spot because I didn't ask you this before. <laughs> okay. That, that you still, that you still, that still goes on in your community that you think is like, like a traditional practice or a traditional thing that you are like, think is really still good for kids. Is there anything that you can think of like that? Hey, you know, this happened when I was in school, we still do it to this day. And still it's one thing I love. Day. Um, you know, I, I can't necessarily think of anything that's this truly specific. That's really escaping me right now. Of something that's true, but I do know um, the one thing that even as we've grown larger, I think that hasn't changed in many ways is the way that our community is supportive of our students. Right. Um, you know, on Friday nights in in the South, uh, people love high school football, and they still do. And uh, I think you know you you have people who I look around and they come to our athletic events, and they don't necessarily have a child. It's not like they have a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew that is playing athletics, but yet and still they're still out there. They're supporting us. They're you know they're cheering for us. They cheer for the dance team when they perform, they cheer for the band when they perform. Um, we have um, the high school uh, chorus uh, that's uh, a great program and uh, they do uh, two major shows a year, a holiday show and a spring show. And every time that they, uh, that that is, we have a full house. We have people who, their grandparents of somebody, but not necessarily grandparents of children in the program who actually buy tickets year after year after year and come out and support that. So I don't know if there's necessarily any one thing, but I can say uh, for certain, we certainly feel the support of our student of our community for our students, regardless of whether they're parents or not. Well, the, the, the interesting, I think I wrote this in Innovator, Innovator's Mindset. I said mm -hmm. basically 50 years ago, relationships are the most important thing in edu we're in, in education and 50 years from now will be the exact same thing thing and, yes. and, and probably even more so right um, yes. and we, we were talking a little before i grew up in a very small town in canada and um it, it was really tough to see uh years ago there was a horrific uh bus crash that um killed um several players from the the, the local hockey team and it was such it was like such a horrible thing and one of the things i did know through that i'm like is as horrible this is that community like that community is going to come together like that was something that i just knew would happen and to watch how where i grew up because i knew how important it was that people connected and took care of each other and there's something that uh even in tragedy i was proud of to watch that how that right. you know my, my my town came together 
um, to take care of one another. And that's something that I, I, I'm really proud of. I, I got to ask you this question. Do you know I'm a basketball fan, right? Yes. Are you, are you, are you a Charlotte Horn, Hornets fan? Or do you like, is that, does, do they count? Cause they're North Carolina. I don't know. I know there's this like line. North Carolina. Like so, so if they're playing, I am going to root for them. And indeed I am going to root for them. Uh, but I will say probably in my house, I'm much more of a football fan than I am a basketball. I mean, I, I love the local team. Uh, and that's great. And I'm happy if the Hornets win, but it, it, they're not really my team. <laughs> well, I, cause I actually, there is a LaMelo ball. He's a kid yes. in there. Yes. And, uh, Oh, do I love him? He is like, <laughs> yes. he is like one of my, I love watching him play. He's super fun. I was a big magic Johnson fan was a kid and he kind of reminds me of him. He does like, he's some flat, he's just like flashy, but he's, he, he's like, um, I know this. I know if I ever got to play basketball, like if I got to play the NBA, which would never ever happen, I would never get close. I'd be the happiest person ever. I'd be smiling the whole time, and I just—that's what he makes me feel like. He's just like, oh, I get to play basketball. This is the greatest thing ever, right? <laughs> ever. I get to yes. play basketball, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, and uh, what uh, Trevor Lawrence? He plays in Florida now, right? Yes, yes, well, yes, yes. I, I, how's he doing? He's not doing so good in the NFL. <laughs> There, no, do you, do you follow him still? Like, do you follow him? I, I I do follow him. I I I I'm going to tell you. I this is going to sound horrible, okay. but I, I love high school football. I love college football. I really don't care about the NFL. Right. <laughs> this is horrible. Right. But I really, I could take it or leave it. <laughs> is it hey, can I get ask you this? Because like I'm new to Florida. Is the Florida <laughs> considered the South? Is this is there, are they going to be crazy about football down here too, or what? <laughs> I, I think they're going to be crazy about football. I, I would say, well, Florida, it is the South, but it's not really. <laughs> right, okay. I mean, as a true no, Southern person, I'm like, mm, no. Yeah, because I'm like, well, we're more South than you. So is this the South? I don't know. But, 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 I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm thinking North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina. <laughs> and I think the South right, and, right, and go right. that way, not <laughs> Like saw it off. Okay, I got you. Okay, so no, last love you still. <laughs> I know, I know. So last question I got for you. Um, okay. You okay? So the last couple of years have been, you know, kind of a thing. It's been <laughs> really, really tough. Um, yes, yes. But this year, um, so you are like I. I met with you all in uh, middle of July. July. Yes. You you were probably back in school in August or even yes, was it? We early? were, we so were like, back in school about exactly a month later. You were there mid July and mid August. We were back in school. Uh, okay. So has it been like, okay, this is like, how, how has it been so far? Has it been like, okay, this is like kind of like the, this, like, are you still having some of the disruptions that were last year? Or is there kind of like a, a smoothness going on? So we, we're not having quite the disruptions of when, uh, I guess, school year 2021 and 21, 22, where there were, you, know, you still kind of had moments where you had to shut down or close down. We haven't experienced that yet, right. thankfully. Right. We're, we're really not. But um, I, I will say the one thing about our district is, is that in 2021, we really worked to get back to a sense of normalcy. And that is our elementary kids. We brought, we did lots of safeguards, but we brought our elementary kids back full fledged. Our middle and high school kids were on a, a flexible A day, B day, and then they got to all. So really last year in 21, 22, we were full fledged. We were, we were in school every day. Uh, we quarantined when necessary, but we really weren't shutting down uh, to the degree that some places still did. So, and I think that shows, I think our teachers worked really, really hard. Um, academically, we we show some gains where uh, we're back to pre-pandemic performance in our uh, content areas. And we're really very, very thankful. We, we've tried to keep as much going as we have. So um, I, I'm pleased with how this year is going. I hope it's going to continue. Uh, I do think the one thing that I, I do um, have the most concern about is is the overall health and well being of our teachers and the health and well being. Don't get me wrong, the health and well being of the children is important too. But at, every day, I want to make sure that our teachers feel supported, that they feel loved and cared for and uh, that we want to support them in being able to do their best with students. Well, so I, I'm a big believer that anxiety and trauma is passed on. 
that yes. if, if your teachers are feeling it, it will be going to the kids. I, yes. I truly this. So as, as you're talking and you're telling me this about your staff, so I distinctly remember this now. It, it hit me because I re, when I asked you to be on the podcast, I said, look, I am going to be super busy. I'm on the road. But when I get back, I'm going to reach out to you and you're going to be on the podcast. And by reach out to you, like right after I was there. Yes. And I, I actually wrote down when you were talking to your staff that I have to have Millie send them on my, so you and I had gone back and forth <laughs> through email yes. before yes. to come there. I didn't really know much about you. Yes. The speech you gave to your teachers was one of the most heartfelt, emotional, powerful things. And I remember I'm like, I love this woman. She is absolutely incredible. <laughs> the way she talks Thank about your you. staff and the way your staff, like it was very authentic. And I was like, oh, they actually like her too. <laughs> It's not always the case, right? Okay. Right. I'm, I'm glad that yeah. she knows that. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. Because I remember, I remember actually, I was like, I was there and I was started crying. I'm like, I don't know anybody. Why am I crying? Like, what is going on? Here? <laughs> and I remember that. And it maybe, and it was like, I think sometimes, you know, you are in a central office position and mm -hmm. there is this like, there has been, especially in the last couple of years, this us versus them mentality mm -hmm. that I've right. seen, you know, on social media, you've seen it in places. And one of the things I really appreciated about your community and, you know, like just, it was just really is like, Hey, we're all here working together so that we can help you help the kids. And you were, and that's, and then I like wrote on my phone in my notes, I asked Millie sent to be on my podcast. Oh, that's thank that's, you. that's what I asked thank you. you. So I remember that it was very, it was a very emotional yeah, I won't. I was. I. I. I would ask you to like tell us what you said that day, but I don't want to cry <laughs> on my podcast right now. Okay, well let's not cry. On, let's not cry on the podcast because I, I. I. Our teachers really are. They are digging in every day, and yeah. we are so grateful for all they do. And you, I could. That was the thing to me that really stuck out was the pride you had, and that yes. really connected with me. And I was. I. Was, I felt very proud to be an educator, to see how you and your teachers interact with one another, it really made a difference. And that's, that's why I wanted to talk to you today. So anyone, uh, everyone that you're listening, thank you so much, Millicent, for being on the podcast. Make sure you connect uh, and you can find the details down below in the description. Millicent, it's okay. so good to see you again Great today. to see you too, George. I enjoy being here. It's a bright spot in the day. So thank you for having me. Love I appreciate it. it. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a wonderful day.